some apostles, specifically some who were fishermen, and used that language appropriately to uh, tell them they would come to a different work. Um, Mark chapter 1 and in verse 17, as you see on the PowerPoint, is where the lesson starts. Mark 1 and verse 17, we'll say in verse 16, when as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed them. He makes an interesting point there because obviously this is about evangelism. Um, I think most of us, uh, if not all of us, understand that, that when we're talking about being fishers of men, we're talking about bringing the gospel of Christ to men so that they can become disciples themselves. But notice he says in the middle of that second paragraph on page 77, fish are caught with a net. Lost souls are caught with the gospel, not with gimmicks, uh, food, fun, frolic, world philosophies and pop psychology, feel-good stories, bait-and-switch tactics, etc. That's important. Um, In John chapter 6, you see that Jesus fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread and and two fish, and um, they realized it was a miracle when he created out of nothing, and there was 12 baskets of fragments left over. And then they started seeking Jesus again, and, and why were they seeking him? He says, you seek me for the bread and the fish (laughs) to fill your stomachs. You don't seek me because of its implications. And so um, we need to understand that. If we try to attract people to the gospel with these kind of gimmicks and philosophies and and psychology and and fun and all that kind of stuff, that's what they're coming for. And uh, that's what they're going to be. They're not going to be true disciples of Jesus. We need to trust in the gospel and its power to bring men. Um, so he says, I will make you become fishers of men. What's the implication of that? I will make you become fishers of men. They're not yet. They're not yet. So, how will they be? He's going to teach them. That's important. Who can be men catchers, fishers of men? Disciples of Christ, period, right? Those who decide to be disciples of Christ. I think it's been said before throughout these studies, because we've really hinted on evangelism throughout all of these lessons. It's something that always comes up, and and rightly so, is that if you know anything, I mean, if you're a Christian, you know something to tell someone else. Um, And that's important. There are going to be some other things. I believe it was Jeff that said that, actually, but I believe there, there are several situations that a babe in Christ might find themselves, and they don't know the answer to that but they can tell you what to do to be saved. And, and we need to take advantage of that. Um, anybody can be men catchers or fishers of men or um, those who, who take the gospel to lost souls. So I want to notice too as well, you know, in Mark 1.17, as we just read it, it will make you become fishers of men. In Luke 5 and verse 10, he says, Do not be afraid from now on you will catch men. Um, that word catch is found twice in the New Testament. It is... Uh, a word which literally signifies, Vine says, to take men alive. It's a compound word from zoos, alive, and agruo, to hunt or to catch. And so we're catching men alive. And the only other place it's used is in 2 Timothy 2.26 when it's talking about Timothy's need to teach those who have been deceived by error. And he says that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. That is, the devil didn't just slay them. Certainly they're dead spiritually, but they're not incapacitated. The devil caught them alive so that they could do something for him. Now, they didn't know it, but I think the opposite could be said. When we're we're catching men, we are catching them alive so that they can be servants of the Lord, so that they can act in regard to the Lord's will and do His will. And so uh, we'll get to Matthew 28. Um, at a later point in the lesson, Jesus commands that we make disciples. That's always and it's an easy way to remember it. Disciples make disciples. Uh, preachers don't. Elders don't. Disciples do. Preachers and elders are disciples. But all Christians are disciples and are to be making um, disciples of all the nations, teaching them, baptizing them, so on and so forth. One other thing before we get into the contents of the lesson. What's... What's often the kind of discussion we have when we talk about evangelizing? 
Oh, that's broad. Just what comes to your mind? If we wanted to have a weekend about evangelism so this church could be better at it. Okay. All right. So you're reading my mind because that's what I want to hear, but... Yeah, that's a good point. So maybe, yes, I'll give you another chance. Okay. Yeah, it's a way of life. That's, that's exactly the point because disciples who are following their master, they're going to make other disciples and bring them into that way of life. That's a good point. So what I was looking for is the wrong answer first. Well, not the wrong answer, but the, the wrong focus, I think, sometimes. And there's nothing wrong with this, but you have a, a series of, of lessons like a book, a material that you, you use to convert people. I have some of those in my office as well. There's nothing wrong with that. Or, or we have this seminar where we decide, you know, how we, like a sales pitch almost. This is how you start. This is how you go through, and this is how you make the sale. This is how you finish. And we, we kind of take something that is human and of, of human wisdom, and we throw the scriptures into it, and we think that's what's going to be successful. I'm not saying it's wrong to have a plan. We need to have a plan, and, and a lot of those things are, are good plans. What is the main problem in our failures to evangelize? Execution. Execution. Maybe it's love. Maybe it's we're not living the way of life. Uh, not having the faith that's going to do its job. This person's not going to listen. They're, they're not really a subject of, of the gospel, and it's like the gospel's not powerful enough to save them. That's the point, yes? Fear of rejection. Fear of rejection, exactly. So these aren't, these aren't uh, difficult things to come up with. It's, you're delivering it wrong. You know, you've got the wrong strategy. You know, most of the time it's because we're, not even just, we're just not even trying. And it's, it's because of all these kinds of factors and more that we could talk about. And so when we talk about being those who make disciples and evangelize, we need to have the kind of mindset that the apostles had in Acts 4. Remember, Peter and John are arrested, and they, they command them not to ever speak in the name of Jesus again. And he, they, he said, what, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. And then he said, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. If, if it's such an important thing to you and such a life changer for you, and you're passionate about it, you're not going to be able to keep from telling people about it. That's, that's the root of it. Uh, if we truly are convicted, if we're truly thinking spiritually every day and we're seeing souls and not just warm bodies, then we can't help but tell them about the gospel. And that's the key. Um, strategies can be talked about and all that kind of stuff. I'm not saying that's wrong, but it doesn't matter what strategy you have, what salesman gives you the keys to making sales, you won't do it if you don't have a passion for bringing lost souls to Jesus. Yes? Well, a lot of times strategy can be wrong. We always think that there's some way that we can improve on this and make people accept it better. Yeah. Well, it can't be said any better than the way the Holy Spirit reveals it. Exactly. I think a lot of times we get in the way. Yeah. Whether it's with our bias, our prejudice, our think so's, our. Uh, and we're hearing a lot about that nowadays with, oh, there's this new, you know, there's this new approach to yeah. saving souls. The only thing to save souls is what the Holy Spirit reveals. Yeah. That's a great point, and that's, that's just it. That is a good caveat to add to that. Well, there's nothing wrong with talking about how we're going to execute this and what we're going to say first and how we're going to say it. We need to have the caution there that we're not putting our wisdom before God's because then we can change things. Marie? Yeah, that's a good point. There, you know, some of the things that used to be done are not done as much anymore, and, and we have our reasons that we suggest for why we don't. But you know, it's always been the case that we just need to go. We need to do right. 
That's a great point. We need, to, we need to talk about that and think about those opportunities and maybe encourage each other to get a little group and go do some stuff. But I, I'll tell you that your most successful or, or possibly successful opportunities will be those interactions and relationships you have with people. Uh, even strangers, just a one-on-one, you start strike up a conversation with someone. Um, always have the motivation to talk about spiritual things. All right, anyone else on that kind of intro? Yes, Scott. If you're not confident or anything like that, just start with uh, inviting them to worship. Yeah, that's a great starting point. You know, and invite them to get them here. And... Yeah, uh, just every little bit counts. Uh, getting them to worship. They come, they have an interest. <laughs> that gets the ball rolling. That's an excellent point. Do something to introduce the gospel to them. All right, so he talks about how um, we should be fishers of men, but why? And so he gives a, a series of seven points about that, and we'll get through them today, I promise. But firstly, um, we make uh, we, we catch, catch men for Jesus. We're fishers of men because we're following Jesus. Uh, someone, if you don't mind, read Luke 19 and verse 10. Luke 19, verse 10. But a son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Exactly. You remember in, he came to seek and save that which was lost. You remember in John's gospel, John chapter 3, um, he talked about condemnation and that he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Um uh, verse 17 of John 3, God, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. But then he explains condemnation comes to those who reject the light. His purpose in coming to the world was not to separate the sheep from the goats, not to judge. That's His second coming. That's, that's going to be His purpose. It didn't mean that He didn't convict the lost souls. It didn't mean that He didn't point out sin. And it didn't mean that there wasn't any condemnation, as He goes on to talk about that he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. And so you kind of bring it on yourself is what he's saying. But his whole focus all the time was, I'm going to make sure that these people have a chance to obey, to, to avoid condemnation. And that should be our focus. Uh, we talk about attitude and, and checking ourselves and making sure we're, we're having the proper motivation. Jesus, it doesn't matter what he said and how he said it, it was always to seek and save the lost. And I would tell you that even with the Pharisees, as hard, to, as, hard as their hearts were, his, his words were always with the effort to prick their hearts and bring them to the truth. And so that should be our motivation, and we should have our, our speech be seasoned with salt and such. But that was his focus, and that should be our focus as well. Any comments or questions on that? All right. Galatians 2 and verse 20 says that... Um, Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so if, if Christ came to seek and save the lost, and Christ is living in Paul, and he's surrendered his will entirely to him, you put two and two together, Paul should be seeking to save the lost, and he certainly was. Uh, but when we talk about Galatians 2.20, it's, it's usually about making the sacrifices we need to make abstaining from the sin we need to abstain from, uh, pursuing righteousness in other ways. But a big part of that is going to be I'm seeking to save the lost. I'm going to, to be a fisher of men, and that's extremely important. First John 2, 6, walk as he walked. Um, every step he took, it was with intent to find lost souls and bring them the gospel of Christ. So that's a pretty obvious one. If you're following Jesus, you should be making disciples. You should be seeking to save the lost. Any comments or questions on on that one. All right, number two. Um, it gives us a sense of, of purpose. It um, says that he called Peter and Andrew for a purpose. Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And then they fished for men. You know, you remember Peter as well in, in uh, John chapter 20, uh, or 21 rather, after the resurrection appearances and such, and he went back to fishing. Uh, he had found a new purpose in Christ, didn't he? And he started working in spiritual ways and, and fishing for men and, and sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning about him. And then because he denied the Lord and he's 
he's found great failure in his mind and and how could he possibly be used in service of the Lord again? And I think Bruce preached a sermon on this, actually, when he came to our meeting. But uh, he turns back to his old purpose, which is not very f- fulfilling, is it? Uh, this gives you the greatest sense of purpose. It's kind of like the discussion we had uh, just a minute ago about love. Um, that's our focus in life. That's our created purpose. And if you want to find a reason for being it will be to bring lost souls to Jesus. That's, that's what we should find our purpose in. Um, and, and that's going to be fulfilling as well. I can tell you as an evangelist myself, preacher of the gospel, that there's no greater fulfillment than um, studying the word of life and being able to communicate it and having someone edified by it or someone convicted of the truth to turn away from their sins. Um, purpose is a big part of this. Any comments or questions on that? We can get through this fast. The compassion part of Jesus and the link with Jesus and understanding compassion of Jesus. Yeah. So you mentioned long ago uh, when you looked at one of the stars. You know, and and that continues to thrill us. I think it would be really smart if if we want to judge people, you know, walking by them. Yeah. Yeah. That compassion for them that maybe nobody has, you know, in this sense, shown them a, a basis. Yeah. And really, if we do want to serve Christ, are we doing that? Do we have that same compassion that Christ had for lost souls? Yeah, that's a great point. A lot of times in the world, when you talk about purpose, finding purpose, you know, a lot of times, and, and it's a noble thought, you know, people talk about serving each other, whether a doctor. I became a doctor because I want to save lives. That's my purpose. Or, or you know, some other form of service or whatever it may be. It, you know, join the military because I want to protect and to serve and so on and so forth. You know, we're talking about seeing the value in human beings and the sanctity of life and protecting that or, or serving it, making life better. It, it may be something, um, you know, like, you know, some luxury that we have or whatever and, and there's, there's just something that makes life better and you get into that field and, I just know that it improves people's lives, it makes it more comfortable or gives them enjoyment, whatever it may be. You kind of hear that kind of talk a lot when you ask someone why they're doing what they're doing. Why did you choose this profession? There's a deeper thing to it than just making money. And uh, there's no greater purpose, no greater service, no greater care than spiritual. And uh, that's what we should be. And in Matthew 28, I I told you that we'd get to that um, beyond the introduction. So in Matthew 28, in verse 18, Jesus said... All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So he says, disciples are to be made. It's the Lord's will and design for his kingdom that disciples make more disciples. The very, the very purpose of being a disciple of Jesus, as we've already talked about because we're following him in the first point, is that we are learning from Him but imitating Him. And we talked about that in the very first lesson. What is discipleship? It's more than just being a pupil. It's being an adherent. It's being an imitator. And His whole purpose, again, is the salvation of souls. That's why He came to earth. That's why He reigns from heaven. That's why He revealed His will. And so that make, makes sense that disciples then make disciples. They follow what their teacher did himself. Um, Acts chapter 4 again, He had said... We cannot but speak. But before that, in verse 13 of Acts 4, uh, they saw the boldness of Peter and John. You know, they're fishermen. They perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled and realized that they had been with Jesus. And so, if you spend time in the Word, if you spend time in following it, you spend time with Jesus, that's how we spend time with Jesus. We're in fellowship with Him. We're in a daily walk with Him. It's going to come naturally. Um, you can do the Bible drills and learn and memorize Scripture and all that kind of stuff, but until you really have fellowship with the Lord and you're with Jesus on a daily basis, then we're not going to have that sense of purpose like He had in coming to this earth. And so that's a great point. The reason we make 
uh, disciples, the reason we try to catch men for Jesus is it's, if that's our purpose. And if that's what you make your purpose, then it'll happen. Comments or questions on that? Yes, Scott. Um, and rightfully so. When we think of this, we think uh, so often of, you know, friends, neighbors, and so on. And yes, also make sure you're saving your own household. Yes. You know, start at home. Uh, we can look around here, and, and a lot of the congregation and the members here have other relatives that were Christians and so on. Uh, and then we also have, you know, a lot of families that, you know, people have fallen away and so on. And there's also a lot that that have stories of where somebody taught them, you know, the yeah. truth. You know, I know James Buckley up on the front row, you know, was his roommate taught him the truth. And we've got a lot of stories like that. So it can go, everybody is a prospect on right. something like that. But, you know, be sure and start at home. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, we want to save the world. Um, the world's a big place. And what that can lead to is just kind of a, a paralysis from fear of uh, the job being too big, but, you know, the job at home, like you're talking about, that's big enough. And I think that's where, when you think about institutionalism and we need to have a missionary society and we need to have all these congregations put our funds together to do a bigger work, that's where we get into that kind of trouble is because we, we give ourselves a bigger job than what God gives us. God just wants us to save the souls we come into contact with. And it starts at home because if you're not saving the souls at home, you're not going to be effective saving other souls as well. We, we talk about influence and all that kind of stuff and other lessons. That's going to play a part into this. Plus, when you save the souls in your home, they're going to go save souls too. And so it, it rises exponentially. That's a great point. Yes. One more thing. <laughs> okay. uh, and after you, if you have saved souls at home, mm -hmm. you're still not done. Right. You know, I mean, there's still prayer and influence and, and so on. Yeah, great point. We see it all the time, you know, people living a great Christian life and at 40 spin off the rails or 50 or whatever. Right. So we're just always having to work to save and to keep saved. Yeah, that's an excellent point. It doesn't stop at uh, baptism. He says, make disciples, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. So there's a nurturing of that growth. And uh, it's, you know, saving is a, a process. Our our ultimate salvation is in the form of a promise. We don't have it until we get to heaven. It's We're being saved as we're continuing to grow and as we're continuing to, to um, let Jesus have that effect on our hearts. So thirdly, it will please our master. We're going to go be fishers of men because it's going to please our master. He gives some contrast. Firstly, we're not to please ourselves. We won't read all these. They're things we've read throughout this study. But Matthew 16, 24 talks about self-denial. Um, and it goes to that same point of fear. What if, what if I'm going to uh, affect my relationship with this person or, or I'm going to be rejected or I'm going to be seen as weird or whatever? I, I'm not here to please myself. I'm here to please Jesus. What's the second one that he mentions? We're not here to please who? Our family. And so Scott mentioned, you know, people have families where there's most of them Christians. People have families where they're the only ones. And uh, they value those relationships. And I think we get ourselves into that mindset where I don't want to mess this up by introducing something that, like Paul did with Festus, you know, is going to really have them thinking about things when he reasoned about uh, righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. And he said, all right, I don't want to hear it anymore. Um, that can be a problem we deal with. But we're not here to please our family. We're here to please the Lord. And so we need to make the step that's necessary. And what was the third one he mentioned in the lesson? Yeah, people of the world. Um, do not love the world or the things in the world. Uh, Galatians 1 and verse 10, Paul talked about how you know, if I sought to please men, I wouldn't be a bondservant of Christ. And so I'm not going to give you some other gospel. I'm not going to say that their gospel is better or that their gospel has legitimacy to it. It's a false gospel, and you're wrong in believing it because I'm trying to please who? God. That's, that's the only thing that matters. Is, and that's why Jesus gave it in that that order. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And so when we're being fishers of men, we're doing it ultimately 
because we love God and we're wanting to please Him. So go to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. And when Paul is talking about, as you're turning here, his hope of this resurrection body in the first eight verses, but the fact that as he's present in the body, he's absent from the Lord, but he wants to be present with the Lord. He's longing for that. He says in verse 9, um, well, Second Corinthians 5, verse 9. DJ, you want to read it? Thank you. At all points in time is basically what he's saying. If we're present with him, absent with him, we're, we're making our whole focus to please him. Um, that's all that we can think about. And it, and it follows through in the very context, verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your conscience. And so I'm wanting to please God, and when I know about the judgment, as we'll talk about in just a second, God says, since you know about that, you're obligated to tell others about it. And so I, I'm not only trying to please God, but if I'm trying to please God, then I'm going to try to warn others about what's coming. So Ezekiel 33 and verse 11. You remember the context of the watchman? What's the watchman's job? He's to watch. Uh, I've gotten ahead of myself. That's later on. But still, what's, what's, the, what's the job of the watchman? To look out and when he sees something, what? Sound the warning. And if you don't, the blood's going to be on your own hands. Um, and the reason for it is such a, a, a severe thing, and I'm trying to tie this together because i got to have myself, but I think I can. The reason why it's such a severe thing, when you're given the responsibility to sound the warning, and if you don't and they die, the blood's on your hands, is because God does not want people to perish. It's a terrible thing to Him. It always will be. And so He puts that as a responsibility in our hands and as he's trying to save people, he's doing it through his disciples. So in Ezekiel 33 and verse 11, Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? We need to warn them, because it will please our master, since he doesn't want anyone uh, to be lost. I can't remember when the watchman deal comes up. Point six. So we're going to revisit that, but... I think I did okay in tying that together. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4. Uh, what does that say? You can paraphrase it. God wants all men to and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Those two always need to be brought together as Jeff was talking about before. The ultimate power to save is not how we're going to say it or, or you know, what kind of strategy we're going to take because that might get in the way. We bring them to the knowledge of the truth. That's how they're going to be saved. So those two things are, are side by side and parallel uh, because to be saved is to come to the knowledge of the truth. To come to the knowledge of the truth, the saving knowledge is to, to be saved. Fourthly, why are we to be fishers of men? There's a great need. Um, always. There's always a great need. Uh, you know, before... Uh, you know, when, when you think about inventions and so on and so forth, the first thing that popped into my mind just now was the Internet. Before the Internet was a big thing, people were probably like, I'm not going to get into that work because no one knows about this. It's not, not a big deal. And now companies can't get enough tech people and people that know how the World Wide Web works and how all this technology works. And so there's a greater need now than there was back then. And I think that with that, there will always be a, a great need, but maybe someday some new thing comes along and all that, you know, is, is in the trash. DVDs aren't a big thing anymore. Um, they used to be, and so there was a need for workers in that industry, so on and so forth. Uh, one thing that there will always be a need for on this earth is the medical field. Um, when I was thinking about what I was going to do, um, that's what someone told me, you know, well, you're always going to need nurses, you're always going to need doctors. And I was thinking, yeah, right, like I'm going to be a doctor, right? Um, I'm glad I got into what I got into. But there's always a need for it. But even greater than that, even healthy people need what? The truth. There's always a need for this. And so uh, certainly we should be doing it. Uh, Matthew chapter 9. This was alluded to earlier by someone. Matthew 9. Someone want to read verse 35 through 38 of Matthew 9?
the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send our laborers into his harvest. Thank you. What was his compassion motivated by? What led to it? Ultimately, in verse 36, I know that he saw sicknesses and diseases. Yeah, scattered as people without a shepherd, a sheep without a shepherd. That's, that's big. Mark's gospel in Mark chapter 6, when he records the feeding of the 5,000, he sees all these people, and it describes it the same way as a sheep without a shepherd, and that's when he feeds them too, but... He, he fed them, he brought them in and fed them because he was going to teach them and they needed some food because they were going to be there a long time. His compassion was motivated by the spiritual realities that he, he knew of, that they were lost without a shepherd. James? In the New King James it says uh, they were weary, but in the American Standard it says they were distressed. Yeah. And the, the reason why they were distressed is because of the, the lack of a shepherd. And that's, that's what really moved him to compassion. He yeah. saw their true need, and that's what gave him the compassion for them. He knew that they needed this. Yeah, that's a great point. They, he, I mean, in, in him even uh, knowing the hearts of men and stuff, he knows their greatest problem, their greatest need is spiritual. Um, and there might have been some who didn't really get that, but the problem was still visible. Uh, they didn't know what to do and where to go. He would be the answer to that problem. And so he moved with that spiritual compassion for their spiritual well-being. Um, so that's a great point. And we, we've alluded to it before, but he talks about on page 79 at the very top. Uh, I highlighted it, and he says it better than I could. So as followers of Christ, we are to look upon the lost as he did. The masses of men we see are not mere mortals who are involved in worldly endeavors. They are immortal souls on their way to judgment. Um, there's a quote, and I didn't put it in, so I'll paraphrase it, but by C.S. Lewis that I really like that I came across uh, a while ago. And it's basically when you see somebody, you've never seen a mere mortal. So when you joke with people, you're not just joking with just, uh, you know, flesh and blood. You're not just joking with a mere mortal person. Uh, you're, not, you're not lying to mere mortals. You're not mistreating mere mortals. You're not helping just mere mortals. When we interact with each other, we're interacting with eternal souls. And that's the way we need to view it. And either that's a, a soul that is corrupt and sin decayed and on their way to eternal destruction, or that's a soul that is in the image of Christ, that has hope, that is radiant. And so you wouldn't want to affect that for the negative, but you would want to affect for the positive the one that is dark and corrupt. And so... We need to view each other in, in that way. Are we lost? Are we saved? Do we need aid and encouragement and edification? Uh, rebuke, re, re, uh, rebuke, exhort, um, fall along suffering and teaching and tell us Timothy. What, what do we need? And when we see the souls in the world, they need the gospel. That's how we need to view them. Yes. Sorry, I didn't see you over there. Yeah, that's an excellent point. You know, it, and and uh, if we see a person stranded on the side of the road and and really grave danger, you know, it's actually something that everyone understands. You would want to stop and help them and save them, and that's the kind of thing. It, you know, you're a shy person. It's awkward. You don't think about that when you see someone in danger like that or in great need. And and you're exactly right. If we have that, if that's our passion, if that's our focus, if that's our desire then the rest is going to, to be salt. Shyness won't be a problem if you're passionate about it, if you're passionate about souls. Uh, we need to have the, 
the mindset of Isaiah. Here am I, send me. That's who the Lord is seeking. People who are willing to be sent, and he's sending them. Remember in Acts 8, the persecution? Um, who went everywhere preaching the word? Christians, the disciples. So we need to go preaching the word. Uh, these last ones will be a little quicker. But in 2 Kings chapter 7, and the fifth point is it's the right thing to do. We won't read this. So that verse 9 is there on your book, so we can read that in a second. But um, in 2 Kings chapter uh, 7, rather, Syria besieged Samaria. In chapter 6, you see how bad it is. And, and it talks about how donkey's heads are expensive for food and dove droppings are expensive. It talks about how there were two women who agreed together to eat their own children. And after they ate the, the first person's child, the second woman said, no, I'm not going to eat it anymore. And so it's bad. You know, the city is besieged. And there's some lepers outside, and, and they decide we'll either die outside the city or we'll die by going to the enemies to try to make peace. And they go to the enemies, and the enemies aren't there because God made a bunch of noise. They thought an army was coming upon them, and they fled. And so they're gathering up the gold and the food and all this kind of stuff, and they stop, and they said to one another, verse 9, We are not doing right. This day is a day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. We need to tell someone. This isn't just for us. We need to tell someone. And so it's the right thing to do. Uh, we can't keep the gospel to ourselves. Um, in Psalm 32, David talked about the blessedness of the man to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. And if we realize that blessedness, then we will go and tell others about that. And in fact, at the end of the psalm, that's what he did. He says, I'll instruct you. Don't be like a stubborn animal, but go to God with your sins and confess them and ask for forgiveness and humility because there is nothing greater than having your sins forgiven and having hope restored. Six, we need to be fishers of men because it is our duty. In Luke 17 and verse 10, after asking for the Lord to increase their faith, when he told them to forgive your brother, always be willing as long as he comes to you and repents. They said, increase our faith. And then the Lord said, you know, if you had faith as a mustard seed, you can do what I said. So you, you can do You have enough faith to act on what I just told you to act on. But then he said, when you do it, you don't expect anything. You just say, we have done what is our duty to do. It's our duty. And so, you know, I've, I've heard of men who know the exact number of people they've baptized. Um, you know, to each his own, I don't try to keep track of that number. It's not a matter of glory for us. It's glory for God. And so we're just doing our duty. It doesn't matter how many people you've converted. It just matters that you're converting people. And the glory goes to God. We're just doing what it is our duty to do. Ezekiel was made a watchman. There it is. Ezekiel chapter 33. It was his duty to sound the warning. The enemy's coming. Um, and if he didn't sound the warning, the blood would be upon his hand. If, if he told the people and they knew and they didn't do anything about it, then their blood is on their own hands. Uh, but if they were not told, the blood would be on his eagle's hands. It is our duty to tell them what's coming. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verses 9 through 11, we already actually looked at that, so we won't do that again. But we must warn. We, we know the terror of the Lord. And I think it's been said before in this, and I, I think it was a, you know, the magician's pen and teller, one of those is an atheist, and he said, how much do you have to hate somebody to know that there's eternal hell and not tell them about it to warn them? It is our duty to sound the warning. We know the terror of the Lord. We know the accounts. We know the warnings. We know the graphic imagery. We need to sound the warning. And lastly, number seven, we need to make... Uh, be fishers of men and make disciples because of the joy of saving souls. Um, remember in uh, Luke 15, Jesus gives various parables about his desire to save the lost and the result of each parable, the, the conclusion and application I say to you in verse 7 of Luke 15, um, that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. With the lost coin, likewise, I say to you, there was joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. And in the parable of the lost son, um, it is right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and now is found. There is great joy in converting souls and bringing them to Jesus 
and giving them the hope that we ourselves have. We need to, to think about that when we go back in the world. Comments, questions, quick ones. Yes, David. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to be judged by the warnings we fail to give. All right. I appreciate your attention. Hope that this study was beneficial to you. Like I said, this is for next quarter, so come up and get them. And uh, we'll be doing that a, a, a little while from now because of singing night in our gospel meeting. Until then, with joy I'll carry on, until the day my eyes behold the city, until the day God calls me home. The things of earth will dim and lose their value. If we recall their borrowed for a while And things of earth that cause the heart to tremble